future trends, deep insights, industry leaders. This is the iGaming Next podcast with your host, Pierre Lint. Welcome back to iGaming Next Online. There's not just one goal, there's multiple goals. Ignore dilution if the deal's good because you'll make more than a bigger point. It wasn't that people preferred the office or preferred remote, they actually preferred the option. In other words, COVID-19 is giving us a glimpse into the future. Um, hello, Daniel. How's it going? All good, thanks. How are you? Very good. We are switching over to English here after our little uh, pre-call here in 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 Swedish. But uh, yes, I'm doing fantastic, uh, Daniel. Actually, it's uh, summer is uh, is bang on here in Malta, 30 degrees plus. Life is good. Uh, we are getting back to normality in some sense, and everything's fine. I got my vaccine last week, so I can travel and all these things now. How's everything for you? Summer is, or spring is here after a slow slow start to that. Uh, I'm getting my vaccine tomorrow actually, so I got a got a ticket yesterday. So uh, excited about that! Hopefully, nice. I will not get any any um, fever stuff from that. But uh, so yeah, hopefully we can travel uh, soon again. So looking forward to that. Nice, nice. Do, do you know which vaccine you are getting? Apparently, I'm getting Pfizer. So uh, uh. so yeah. Knock on wood. Pfizer, <laughs> Pfizer brother. We are Pfizer brothers, uh, <laughs> exactly. Daniel. Very good. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I'm happy. But I can tell you, actually, I mean, now in Malta, there's been a lot of people who have, who have taken the vaccine. And um, it seems to be the traditional vaccines, as in like the AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, um, that uh, seem to produce a lot of side effects uh, here, whereas the mRNA vaccines like Pfizer or Moderna seems to be a bit better and I, I had zero side effects so uh, you know I'll send you uh, my good wishes and blessings here that you'll be fine tomorrow. Nice. Uh, but I, I actually think you, you need the second shot right to, to get the the yeah. uh, vaccine pass to travel uh, without yeah. having to do tests and so on so yeah so we'll see we'll see when I get that I think uh, approximately Three. eight to ten weeks or something in Sweden I think to get the second shot. Oh uh, is it that long yeah, between? Uh, yeah so I heard okay it, yeah. Yeah, in uh, for 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 me with Pfizer it was three weeks, and then AstraZeneca is like seven weeks. But I read something in the Swedish newspaper that uh, it's it takes longer time or whatever. But yeah, anyway. <laughs> the, the only good part with 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 not being able to travel is that finally you can explore your own country instead of going abroad. So yeah. I think I've been, seen more places in Sweden than ever before. So that's yeah. been, I guess, the best part of, with the whole uh, Corona. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's a silver lining to anything, I guess. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> So, 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 Daniel. I mean, you're the you're the CEO and co-founder of Quickspin. You've been you've been there for for the last ten years, you know. And and uh, kind of, I've been reading up on you. Yeah, I know that. It's like when I say I've been living in Malta for ten years, I, I get the same. Well, oh my God, it's been yeah. crazy times. Yeah. Um, but you know, in my little uh, my little research doing this podcast, I um, found out that you are quite the tennis table. Uh, uh, <laughs> table tennis player here. So I would just like to start this podcast by uh, sending you an official challenge that uh, next time you're in Malta or me in Sweden, <clears throat> I'd like to challenge you for a table tennis battle. And, you are and on. The, you are yeah. on. All right. I should not... <laughs> it's been a, it's been a marketing department that's been been. Uh, I blame them for that. I know actually that. When when Oscar and Rasmus from Kasuma went to visit our, our previous office, they challenged me, and and Rasmus was kind enough to post a video on Facebook where Oscar completely smashed me. But <laughs> w- what you do for your customer, I guess, is is, is the important thing here. So exactly, uh, yeah, you, you can't. You, you're not a customer, so so I can uh, I yeah. can beat you hopefully. Uh, exactly, yeah, we can play fairly and squarely here. So yeah, okay, I'm looking forward to that. So there'll be a little follow up here at some point on. Uh, Brilliant, Daniel. But 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 yeah. So I mean, founder of Quickspin. You've been in the uh, agam industry for fifteen plus years, and uh, uh, super fascinating to to have you here uh, on the kind of the topic of leadership and entrepreneurship today, which is super close to my heart as an aspiring entrepreneur. You know, I'm in the beginning of my journey, so I'm really excited today to kind of learn a little bit of what you've learned through your uh, travels and uh, and experiences uh, through the years in the in the industry. Um, and you know, I'd like to start from the beginning today. Um, obviously, you joined NetDent in 2005, 
uh, or, or so. And I'd like to, I'd love to hear from you to explain a little bit what, uh, you know, how was your time there, 2005 to 2010? What did you learn? <laughs> Uh, oh, it was a long time ago, a long, long time ago, and it's crazy when you think about it. But late 2005, I joined, I think my first day was ICE, ICE in January 2006. Uh, and back then, NetEnt was obviously a completely different company than, than what it is today um, and, and, and what, what, what it has developed into. Uh, I was hired by Pontus Lindvall, who was the yep. CEO at the time, and then he, he went off to, to run Betson and... Uh, still there. Uh, Johan Oeman was the CEO and worked with them. But the company, you know, the company was so different. We were 30 people back then. We had a, a revenues generated of about 6 million euros, I think, in, in 2015. Uh, I was there for five years and we, we, we sort of tenfolded revenues. We, we added a lot of customers and the company grew from its 30, 40 employees to 300 employees. So it was one hell of a ride. Um, but of course, the industry as such was also different. In, 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 from a B2B supplier perspective, you had the, you had the likes of uh, Chartwell, if you remember them, Cryptologic, uh, Microgaming, yes. Playtech. And just the way that you sort of sold product and produced content and how you delivered content was different from what it is today. We, we effectively we sold an entire product. We took over the entire casino tab with the operator um, and being able to sort of produce and sell and distribute your, 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 your content was, was much more difficult back then compared to what it is today. Um, but I think what, uh, to try and answer your question, what, what, what made NetEnt fairly successful was that it was a clear focus on doing casino only. You know, if you remember back then in 2005, 2006, it was the poker boom. Yeah. Uh, many of these companies that were referred to, to spun off and focused on different things, you know, poker, bingo, scratch cards, other types of product verticals, whereas... Uh, we went as NetEnt in the, the more or less opposite way. We, we increased the focus on casino. We started focusing more on slots, whereas table games used to be the sort of the dominant, uh, the dominant product line. Um, and I think that was, in terms of learnings, uh, thinking about uh, product strategy and so on, being able to, to sort of truly focus on being good at one single thing it's probably a smart thing, regardless of which industry or which sort of business that you try to run, uh, try to run to to try and be really, really good at at, at one single thing, mm. and that was one of the successes I think uh, behind um, behind NetEnt that that we it was it was um, such a big focus on on um, delivering a casino product, which is was what was at that point in time. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's really interesting because I remember at at BetSafe that uh, when I worked at BetSafe that uh, in 2011 it was Casino Black and it was Casino Red and it was basically NetEnt and microgaming and that was it. Those were the games that you offered and that's how the operators worked back then. I mean, what what changed in general here? Because uh, well, I think if, even at that point in time, if you wanted if you wanted to to get a new operator on your books uh, as a supplier, effectively you had to kick the other supplier out entirely. Yeah. So you know if if you had a a Chartwell casino running running at that point in time, we can talk about them since they <laughs> they no longer exist. You effectively had to kick them out and put your pro own product into that entire tab. Mm. Uh, as a player, when you logged into the site, you deposited money, and if you wanted to play casino or poker or bingo, you had to transfer funds from your main wallet to your, in this case, the casino wallet. So that led to the fact that you could only really have one casino supplier, otherwise you, you would have to have multiple casino wallets. Um, so when I joined, we, we, that's what we tried to do. Either we, we, we wanted to add a casino product to an existing sports book, or we tried to kick the Chartwells and the microgamings and the Playtex out of, of the operator's uh, casino lobby and, and put our own product in there. So uh, it was a race to sell as many casino modules as possible to, to sort of try to, to ring fence the space a little bit uh, yeah. at that point in time. But then, then as technology evolved, um, we went from having sort of a casino wallet to, to the, the operators implemented what was called a seamless wallet, which we, we have in all, in all uh, casinos today or in all operators today, whereas you, you deposit funds to, into your main wallet and then you can play whatever product you, that you want. And that, of course, also opened up the opportunity or, or the threat, depending on which, which um, uh, chair you sit on, 
uh, to access more more customers with your product, but also a threat in terms of, of if you used to own that space, all of a sudden you had uh, had uh, had competition, and that's what happened with Betsafe, I guess, where whereas uh, they had Casino Red and Black, and then all of a sudden everything was merged together um, with with all suppliers sitting under the same uh, shelf space, basically. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I remember that change taking place actually when the seamless uh, wallet was uh, integrated to to BetSafe and what a big project it was at that at that time. And uh, so I guess that that was kind of the starting point for the smaller game studios then to uh, to be able to enter the space uh, at, at all. I guess. And also, w- would you say you know that was kind of the nail uh, not in the nail in coffin, but there was the end of the dominance that uh, you know the likes of Playtex and the um, and the micro gamings and the Netans had at that time. Uh, is that fair to say? Would you say or? Yeah, I think that's 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 the the, the main factor in how the industry changed uh, has changed, and and to some extent, I think micro gaming and Playtex has been fairly successful in in trying to maintain that space. Although it's it's you know as it, evidently so, it's it's gradually opened up. And I remember, so the first four years at NetEnt, I did I did um, sales marketing. We built up the, the Malta team, and then in the last year, as I decided to stay in Stockholm, I, I moved on to product. And the last year at NetEnt, we ran a project where NetEnt had the ambition to open up their platform uh, and try to sort of control the the space. Whereas we saw that you know more and more operators were were moving to seamless wallet. If we could somehow sort of control the channelization of content, we could own the space and we could control that environment. So we were actually fairly close to, to um, pushing the button on the entire product. It went through pre-studies, went through round of negotiations with different suppliers, and, um, but um, uh, a bit short-sighted maybe. Uh, management and board decided to, to pull the plug on that project as it would cannibalize on their own revenues. But of course, if we would, if if Netent would have done that, ten, twelve years ago, um, uh, yeah, I think the the entire industry would have been different uh, compared to what it is today. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, for sure, it was it was the sort of the new era of 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 uh, supplying uh, um, slots and content to 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 the casino tab. Uh, the, the the technology shift in in from wallet to seamless wallet. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's really interesting to think about because, uh, like you were saying, at that time, you know, not don't, like some people within the organizations, like yourself, you 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 recognize where the industry was heading, and uh, at that time, it's kind of like what you proposed to 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 the board of Netland was to kind of take one step back in order to take three steps forward, uh, you know, kind of lose out in the short and midterm to get, to gain in the in the long term. It's really hard sometimes when, in the, when organizations become big enough, and they kind of, it's di- more difficult to take these uh, big strategic shifts in an organization yeah. when we become big. And it's of course, obviously, it's it, it, it's easy to say now in, now in hindsight. I think yeah. NetEnt experienced experienced obviously a lot of growth in many many years. Uh, so <laughs> they did a lot of things successfully, but. Uh, but uh, I think long term they should have done something different, probably. Uh, mm. But as you say, I think many companies face that. Whereas you have probably long term, you know what to do. But then on the other, you know, on the on the other um, hand, you have your short term gains, right? If you would continue yeah. to focus on one thing, you know that probably long term is not the right thing. But then you have your short term gains, and trying to balance that, I think, you know. Uh, Disregarding what NetEnt did or not did, uh, I think that that is the challenge for many many businesses. That that uh, you know you, you need and you, you need to make money here now, but you also need to think about the long term and trying to balance that. That is that is uh, it's not an easy task always to do that. No, for sure. And I mean, uh, as a as a leader as well in an organization, you know, it takes a lot of guts to take risks if if you are a leader in an organization, right? Like uh, it's easy to just maintain the status quo. And for your own safety in that uh, position, for example, but uh, to actually take make like strategic changes is like on an individual level is comes with risk, right? Yeah, and yeah. That's what's holding a lot of organizations back, perhaps sometimes. And I guess it's also a bit about around. I mean, that goes for leaders, and I, th- I think people in, in general. It's it's nice to be in the comfort zone. You know, you know, yeah. sort of the rules, and you know the, the the rules of the game, how to play it, and you do it successfully or sem- semi successfully. You want to just improve in the way that you work today. But but stepping out of that comfort zone and, and then take a sort of 
a leapfrog jump to something else or a leap of faith into something new that is yeah. you know that that's uh, difficult for for both leaders and 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 an organization as well i, I should say it's it's change yeah. is not uh, change is difficult uh, yeah. but but uh, in this industry i think you know unless you change you have no place long term in this industry it's it, it 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 has changed a lot and it will continue to change and unless you adapt to that i think it it's it it uh, those companies uh, will will have a difficult time to survive i think uh, yeah. Uh, and, and you know we mentioned a couple of examples before with with yeah. how it was back then and i think those are good examples of of companies that sort of thought of themselves a little bit too highly maybe or did not adapt to change um, and they are no longer around today although they were back then the giants of this industry um, yeah and it's really interesting to think about because uh, at that time yeah netant had was such a dominant um, dominant player, and um, there, there was a rumor, and I don't know if you can confirm or, de or deny this, but at, at the time, I guess, that you were with NetEnt, there was a rumor that NetEnt was really close to acquiring Evolution. Uh, well, yeah, I actually, I actually posted something on on, uh, on LinkedIn around this uh, a couple of months ago on the last day of trading. So, well, close, I should not say, but but there was a, a clear interest to, mm. to uh, do something together. Um, but uh, Jens and, and Frederick, who ran the company at that time, they, they um, I think, politely said no, uh, yeah. uh, which was probably a wise move. <laughs> in uh, the hindsight, yeah. <laughs> in the hindsight, yeah. So, so yeah, it, it was true. I think that consequently led to, to Net and obviously uh, starting up their own live casino operations. Yeah. Um, the, the, yeah. Yeah, so fair enough. I, I can I can confirm, but not yeah. discuss any details. Okay, fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. Yeah, but but it's interesting to to hear that that was actually the the case, you know. But uh, oh, we're, so, sorry, yeah. can I interrupt you? Just one thing around that, which I think is is kudos to to Jens and Frederick and the team back then. I remember when they presented their vision for the future, where you know live was live was in the early days of live, uh, you know, casino, roulette games, blackjack. It was hard, at least for myself to see sort of what, what could be the next step of this product vertical. And they talked about stuff like game shows and live shows. Oh, wow. And this was back in 2007, 2008. Wow. And now, 13 years later, with, with what, 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 what the team with, I guess, with Todd and, and the other yeah. people in that organization have done is, you know, it, 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 it really is from what was an embryo back then has become a reality now 10 plus years later. So that is, you know, very impressive, I, th I think. Um, th so they had the vision already from the beginning. Yeah, that's so cool that they kind of saw the future back th back then already. I mean, sometimes as an entrepreneur, you tend to like overvalue your own organization, you know, you, because you, you you are sure that uh, this is going to be the biggest thing uh, in the world. But then once in a while, you're actually right about it, you know. And, uh, where, 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 I'm where I'm leading with this is that if we fast forward to today, obviously now, Evolution is in this position where they are seemingly unstoppable, right? But if there's anything we can learn from history, is that that is rarely the case, right? Uh, and um, I I spoke to Todd, the CPO of Evolution, um, a couple of weeks ago about this, and just asked him a question: you know, wh like, what can disrupt Evolution at this stage? You know, right now, like what? How can evolution lose its market share uh, or right, dominance on the on the market? And um, even Todd was a little bit, he had a little bit difficult time to answer this question. You know, uh, yeah. because seeming, seemingly there is uh, th there is nothing really that is threatening them right now. And then he followed up by saying fa famous last words. Uh, you know, like th th you think that you're on the top of the world, and then all of a sudden something comes from left field and changes the game. You know, yeah. But, but, yeah, what, what, do you, what do you think, Daniel? What, what do you think about Evolution? Right? Yeah, I think I think it's an amazing company. They've done, you know, I'm not I'm not uh, a product expert in terms of what they've done with the product and how they run their operations, but from what you hear from customers and the industry, they they you know they are a couple of steps ahead, which I think comes through obviously in the revenues and the, in the share price and uh, you know the results that they deliver, not only in terms of product quality and innovation, but also how how they've managed to scale that company. Uh, looking at profitability and growth rate, also on sort of EBITDA level, uh, so very, very impressive. So, I think it's 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 hard to say, you know, point at a single thing that would that would sort of uh, put an end to to their dominance. But then again, though, you know, 
as in any industry, if, if you have one, you know, very dominant player, right? I think in the end, if you are an operator and you're so dependent on on, on one single supplier, that is a risk in itself, right? If you think about yeah. the bargaining power in, in any supplier, supplier customer relationship, you don't want to be too dependent on one single supplier. So I think that is a threat in itself uh, as you as you as you grow bigger. And I think going back to NetDent and maybe maybe some of the other giants in this space, you know, the, the sort of the, the slowdown of growth um, is partially a result of the fact that they had such dominant positions and, and the operators would want to downplay the the importance of, of, of those suppliers. So I think that in itself is a threat, but yeah. Probably, as, as you say, and, and, and uh, as I understand, Todd referred to, it will probably come something from the side that we're not aware of, the classic Tesla or iPhone uh, yeah. thing that no one takes everyone with surprise. So, so but um, I don't know. It's my honest answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. All right. Interesting. Yeah. No, but I think I think you're right, and and uh, and, and that is kind of the blessing and the curse of being uh, in in the position that they are. Perhaps is that. Uh, yeah, they are seemingly they, they they have a great position in the market, but um, they are such a gigantic organization that it'd be difficult for them to pivot when uh, the trends are, are shifting. You know, and that's where you know you see in general in society through the financial crisis in two thousand eight. That was when a lot of the next billion dollar organizations was born, uh, mm. and we probably will see the same thing now during COVID. You know, the the world is changing, and the next billion. Uh, you know, dollar organizations being born now because the, uh, the society is changing, and yeah. the ones who are adapting to that are obviously the winners. Through this. <laughs> but I mean, with 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 Evo now and the, and the, especially the, with the acquisitions that they've made, it, it's I don't know. It, it's it, I think just thinking back of NetDent that we talked about before, you know, they were in I think, you know, rewinding back to maybe uh, tw- 2011, 2012 when they were sort of started to become the dominant. I think. What is the risk for anyone is that you sort of you stay within your comfort zone and, and in the case with NetDent, we, since we can talk about them as, as, as an old example, I mm. think they sort of lower themselves to be a casino supplier only producing content, mm. whereas with the position that they had with the platform and the integration and the data that they accessed, they could have done so much more out of that because the, because what they chose although successfully, uh, to produce content only, they were sort of in the same position as all other suppliers, as the Quickspins. You know, we we competed mm. on equal terms, although we're, we're obviously not the same as, as a company and we didn't have the leverage as they had, but we were in, in the eyes of the player and in the eyes of the operator, we, we delivered the same thing. And I think you have to sort of, in order to pivot or to level up to some extent, you have to sort of probably take take more than one step a couple of steps ahead to leverage your position as as evo is in right now you mm. know not not being only a, a live casino or live entertainment yeah. provider uh, or maybe move towards something else to to take a different position as because eventually uh, other um other suppliers as playtech or or uh, will will will, will um Will will become closer to to uh, to them in terms of of uh, competitive product and and uh, organization. Yeah, That's exactly. It. Yeah, exactly. So uh, rather than just standing on one leg, kind of thing, uh, yeah. you, you want to diversify your, your organization so that you can meet, uh, kind of uh, shift. And, and meet the landscape that's, uh, that is changing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting to see where, where you know, when we do the next, or not the next one, but when we do a podcast in ten years together, then we can analyze uh, the situation again and go back to see what the results were. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but I mean, disregarding, well, I mean, I think at Evo, I mean, it's going to be very, very interesting to follow to see what they will do with these acquisitions. And I'm sure that uh, that uh, that um, shopping spree has not stopped. It will probably exactly. continue. Mm. Uh, and how they will incorporate that into their product and, and into their offering. Mm. Um, that's going to be super interesting to follow, uh, disregarding on where you sit, I think, in this industry. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with that uh, as well. I'll, I'll, I'll be following that closely as well. So, um Jumping over to something else now, Daniel. Let's uh, let's go back in time here again now. And uh, you worked at NetDent 2006 yeah, to 2010 or so. It was end there, and and then you decide, you know, you're gonna you're gonna leave your comfortable full-time job in this like emerging 
massive tech organization that is doing super well and just uh, take a leap of faith and start your own game studio in this environment, which is just super uncertain. Like, can you talk a little bit about like, how did you come to this realization that I'm going to you know, spread my wings and fly? <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> it was such a long time ago. No, yeah. but I mean, I think to be absolutely honest, uh, the product that I referred to before and, and the position that I was in, not not being able to sort of execute the, the things that I wanted to, maybe a, bit, a little bit stubborn there, you know, not, not uh, the best personality trait always. Uh, so I think <laughs> it, it was more or less an impulsive thing that I, that I, I just, uh, no, I had enough. <laughs> no one Screw is listening, it. I'm quitting. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I actually woke up one morning or, uh, and said, no, I'm done. I need to do something else. And then, <laughs> so I resigned. Uh, I had twins on the way. Um, but I, and I didn't really know what I would do. But then I thought about what I did at NetEnt and, and where, where I saw the industry moving and now it feels like an easy thing since we know the, the, the know what eventually what happened but but with the whole seamless wallet technology shift and NetEnt had especially in the Nordic such a dominant position with no competition and they were the dominant supplier I think there, there was just a need from 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 operators to get diversity and to sort of um, not have a such a dominance from one supplier um so that from a product point of view it was a demand from something from for something new and something fresh uh for me it was obviously a level of self fulfillment in order to to do the stuff that i wanted to do um and and um thirdly uh, maybe a bit naive since i didn't uh, ha hadn't run a company before i wanted to create something company culture wise that were something different from the the organizations that i worked at before so so but i know i couldn't do it myself so so i, I teamed up with uh, joachim who was the customer of of netdent that he used to work at unibet as a casino manager so all right i started asking him some questions around how does this work you know what, <laughs> what do you think we could do here distribution wise and so he was quite excited about the idea uh, and had you know good connections and and, and good knowledge about um, how we would distribute content. Um, I had the business mindset and, and to some extent product, and then we lacked a, a, a product uh, genius. And that's where Mats Vesselon came in. So, so the three of us sort of together, uh, we sort of complemented, I think, each other quite nicely. So I had business, Joachim had sort of general business knowledge and, and distribution and, and had the insights from the operator, and Mats was the product slots guy um so when when the three of us met with my little embryo to an idea it's sort of we just kicked off and and um yeah the rest is is, is, is history we decided yeah. there and then that we should do something and then then uh, fortunately those guys resigned themselves as well so, uh, yeah. so I, I was not the only unemployed uh, founder yeah. <laughs> uh, and then on the back of a couple of powerpoint slides we managed to convince a few people to to make a small investment into our little venture yeah super interesting i mean uh, so you know there's there's a lot that i like to dissect here to kind of when you are in this like starting phase of commit to this like scary thing to start your own organization because i think in general a lot of people they walk around with these ideas you know and and, and uh, of like ideas that could be uh, companies that are eventually worth billions of dollars and yeah. I think everyone has kind of those ideas but the, the difference is that some people they just take that extra step and just commit themselves to this idea and they just go for it you know um, I don't know like uh, for, for you guys when you when you started meeting with with Joachim and, and, and Mats what is was it kind of like things just fell into place immediately and you were just like super excited, super passionate to start this organization or what, what were your thoughts during that time? Like, were you scared? Were you nervous to like leave nothing and do the thing or everything kind of happened organically? Uh, well, for me personally, I, since I already resigned uh, in, 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 in anger, uh, yeah, not in fair anger, enough. I'm just kidding. Uh, since I resigned yeah. sort of it, so for me, it was, it was easy, but I, you know, I contemplated, uh, whether I would do consultancy or, or uh, start other jobs. But I think in the end, when we, all, all of us discussed, and I think also since we had one co-founder coming from the, the operator side, which was 
the potential customer that sort of confirmed the the the, the thoughts that we had. So it all qu- as a business idea and timing wise, it all sort of all the stars I think were aligned. I think timing was was uh, felt. It was really really good at that point in time, and you know in hindsight it was perfect timing. I think starting Quickspin today. It would have been a completely different thing compared to uh, you know the, the the type of company that we built and how how we managed to build it was would have been a different story today than than before. And I think same goes for Netent when they started and with Evolution and with Quickspin. You know, timing is such a big big part of of if you're successful or or if you're not successful. So I think we it felt quite comfortable. I have to say. Um, yeah. But then, what? what uh, sorry, I'm I'm s- s- jumping around here now. But but I know when we started, just actually a couple of months before we even incorporated the company, Joachim had a friend, Ralph Koistermans, who used to work at um, at Unibet as well. He he was working in social gaming at the time, um, and then Playtic, if you remember that company, that w- they were sold to to um, to someone for a you know. Large chunk of money. What was the name? Platica. Platica. Uh, Platica, and then eventually Double Down that was sold to IGT for I think five hundred right. million dollars. Um, so okay. that's that's when we first start to hear about the concept of social social gambling or social gaming, <laughs> and I couldn't believe it when I heard it that, that that can you really gamble on slot machines without being able to win anything? I mean, I, did, I didn't get, I didn't get that concept in my head. Why would anyone yeah. want to pay for 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 playing a slot machine, paying money for that, but not being able to cash out? <laughs> but with Playtick and Double Down um, as the 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 free to play operators operating on Facebook and on App Store, uh, that was a complete smash hit. So whilst we were developing uh, content for the gambling industry, we could distribute the same type of games into. Uh, Ruff's uh, uh, social venture, which was, which was called Plumby. Um, mm. So we had sort of two distribution or business verticals uh, for the business from day one. And that made a, a massive difference for how we, uh, you know, funded the company and uh, how we, we, we so, so the cash flow generated from social funded the, the, the business on gambling. Um, oh, if you're familiar right. with, if you're familiar with, with the social gambling yes. at all. On the on, on the social media side of things, right? So uh, so on Facebook, you would uh, you at that time at least you would be able to play um, uh, the the free to play uh, slot machines. But then after a while, it, it was kind of it was on a freemium subscription basis, or exact freemium yeah. model. So you could play yeah. for to some extent for free, but then if you wanted to continue to play or or compete for that matter with with your yeah. friends, you 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 put in a couple of dollars and then you got sort of virtual coins in return. Um, uh, all right. and, and still today, I think for, for companies like uh, Aristocrat, for example, it's a huge part of their, uh, or if not the only part of their online business today is, 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 is being generated from social uh, with their um, Heart of Vegas app, I think it is, uh, that is the, the, the biggest one. Um, so so still, still a massive industry to this day. And that yeah. sort of, I think, also proved that this is more than just a gambling product. This is an entertainment product. Right. So... so Learning how to sort of monetize from players that could not win anything sort of makes you think a little bit about what what are the drivers here and how can we sort of engage players without having the the monetary aspect of that. So all the things that we learned in terms of of keeping players engaged was was uh, eventually built into our gambling product as well, and that's. Um, so for anyone that's played the uh, Quickspin games, you, you, we have certain features um, such as. Uh, uh, you can sort of buy yourself direct into the bonus round, which is yes. a hygiene factor these days. But we were the first one out. We have achievements. So right. you collect different, you try to do different achievements within the game. And in return, you get tokens. So all the learnings that we took from social in the early days was built into the to the gambling product of, of, of the business. Uh, so that was super good for us uh, in all aspects, both product and, and uh, financial as well. Right. Really I'm not sure if I even answer your question here now. Yeah, but, no, but uh, it's, it's super. No, it's fantastic, yeah, Daniel. I, I like this. Uh, yeah. Like we go a little bit left field and, and, and whatnot. But uh, you know, it's really interesting because um, in the last couple of years, uh, what I hear a lot from the gaming studios is that we need to see our products as entertainment, not gambling, and so on and so forth. But uh, that is from that is your roots, I'd say. That is how how you molded your products in 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 general by starting starting off by creating uh, uh, games from for the social 
yeah. uh, called free to play where it's not about creating the thrill of losing and winning money that's not the currency the currency uh, is the entertainment itself uh, done so it'd be interesting to know this um, so you ma you mentioned here a couple of features but would you say what would you say is the biggest difference like uh, if you can put your finger on it uh, how you keep a player uh, engaged in in a social uh, slot machine versus a uh, uh, um, real money uh, game. The difference between social and gambling, you mean, in in, in terms of engagement? Yeah. Uh, good question. I think. I mean, the the obvious the obvious difference is the monetary aspect, right? That you gamble for your own your own. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, how do you keep players engaged in one product and the other? Does it differ in 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 any way? Not really, because I think the elements yeah. of the game are the same, and ultimately you want to create the. Yeah, sort of an, an exciting experience, and that is, you know, mm -hmm. gambling is 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 uh, so much more than just winning or losing. It's everything in between, right? It's it's yeah. it's you know what what essentially we're bringing to the consumer is is emotions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether you're winning or losing, or close to winning, or sort of mm -hmm. seeing patterns and understanding what's what's going on in the game. So I think that goes the same for 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 the the core of the game. I would say. Yeah. Um, and then I think everything around that, uh, whether it's sort of uh, achievements or or uh, tournaments or or a sort of cream on top of your uh, mm. uh, cake, so to speak. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah fair enough, fair enough. Uh, yeah, interesting to hear. I didn't know that about Quickspin. That that's uh, where, where your roots on the on the social side actually. It's uh, interesting to hear. Um, you know, I have a I have a question on 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 if we take a step back again. Um, when you founded Quickspin, uh, you mentioned as well that on on the on the back of a couple of powerpoints, you managed to to raise investment, and it, and this is something quite interesting because we at like next we went through this process last year of, of raising funds as well for the first time and trying to like understand that process and what it entails, what is it that investor wants, and all these things. Like, can you talk a little bit more? About your process here, you mentioned that it, you know it seemed that it was quite straightforward process for you. But like, w how did it work when you were trying to raise funds? <laughs> yeah, no, it it was. Uh, I mean, uh, to be absolutely honest, it was. We had no clue on what we <laughs> what we were yeah. doing uh, at that point. I mean, we were just happy that anyone wanted to listen to what we had to say. Yeah. Uh, and I think just thinking about what we presented, you know, that was so far from from being sort of professional i think a couple of pe people turned us down very early which uh, they probably regretted regret, regretted doing but uh, yeah we were fortunate to 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 get a couple of uh, seed investors going but i think they they ha also had the same view on where the industry were and where where it was going uh, and that also helped us i think along the way on what we tried to achieve as well if you, if you if you understand the context and if, if you share the view on okay we're here now as an industry we're going to go here and you know within that lies the opportunity they sort of got, grasped that quite early, um, so so uh, yeah, we were fortunate to to get those guys on board, and then I think six months after the seed round, on the back of a couple of letter of intents we had with operators, we raised, we did another round, uh, a second round with with where we went out more on a sort of a sales. Uh, pitch to both in, in Stockholm and London and met different types of investors. Uh, mm. And in the end for us, we, we, we ended up with, with uh, um, uh, a little bit more than a handful of angel investors, um, which, which was, was good, very good for us um, in, in, in how we, how we ran the company and, and uh, the trust they put into us and so on. So, so, um, so we, we, we were turned down by by larger sort of organizations and larger investors, but but we also mm -hmm. turned down a couple of larger investors ourselves. So, so we went with the 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 people that were more similar to ourselves, which which yeah. I think was very good for us. But of course, um, not knowing what what could have uh, come in with with a bigger type of investor. Um, uh, I mean, that would have brought something different to the table, good and bad, I guess. But uh, in the end, it turned out quite quite well. Yeah, is that uh, is interesting what you mentioned? Like, you know, you turned around a couple of investors uh, as well. Like, what? I guess it is sometimes a bit of a blessing and a curse to uh, raise funds um, because you might end up with like a really aggressive uh, venture capitalist who is uh, basically asking from you to uh, 
20W revenue in a very short space of time or <laughs> or it's not interesting to them. Um, uh, like, uh, how, how was it for you guys? Like, what, what, what constituted a good investor for you? Was it someone who had, like, competence in the gaming industry or contacts or... How do you distinguish? Yeah, no, good, good. It, it, I mean, it, it was a while now, so... But I think yeah. in the end it comes down to I think you need to click with the, with the persons that you that that you, that you go with right and I think for us it, it just clicked I knew them I knew some of them a little bit from, we knew some of them a little bit from before mm. so that was that was good they 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 were entrepreneurs themselves uh, having done sort of what we tried to achieve as well I mean they had first hand experience of that so we could get good good sort of have a good sound uh, board uh, on what we wanted to do. So I think that that is ultimately what what it came down to that we had someone that we sort of you know clicked with personality wise and that could bring some experience to the table. And I think also if you're in that position you know founding your first company depending on what type of personality you are but I think for the three of us you know if we would have went with with uh, someone a little bit more aggressive I mean good things could have come out of that as well but I think that would be I think at least I personally would have deemed that as, as high risk obviously high risk high return but yeah. um, trying to build a, you know a good solid company that could sort of that could could um, survive any of us was the sort of the ambition um, and they sort of so building good but building it maybe a little bit slower compared to if you would take a, a venture capitalist firm or or or, 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 or similar uh, they would probably put different uh, targets on us for good and bad of course um, yeah yeah of course you know because I mean as, a, as an entrepreneur you, you go in with so much emotions and stuff like that you, you love your your idea and you want to nurture it and you want it to do well and and you want it to grow mm -hmm. kind of in its own pace and these type of things, where, and and then as opposed to that, there are a lot of venture capitalists who are basically viewing their investment as like probably you know 19 out of 20 of my investments will fail, but the 20th one will you know take over yeah. the world type of thing. Yeah. And uh, and and uh, as if you take capital like that, you need to just basically be prepared to you know most likely I'm going to fail. Yeah. Uh, but it's uh, like you're saying the high risk, uh, high return uh, type of thing. But then I think you, you also have, of course, a lot of startups that just bring in sort of silent capital that you, yeah. you just cash in, and then you have sort of your investors not not being active. And we had so some of them were quite active, which I think was good for us. And I know that friends of mine that sort of raised money that have had very passive investors. So I guess that again, it comes back to how you want to run the company. I think yeah, we were exactly we were. Um, Fairly humble, I think, in terms of this was the first time for us, and, and uh, uh, whereas I think maybe others are more more uh, uh, aggressive, uh, yeah. uh, thinking that they could do it themselves, which they probably can, but uh, yeah. we were not that type of uh, founders. And and why did the investor choose to invest in you? Like, was it because you had a great business plan, or was it more because you, as people, showed promise? Oh, I, I, to, to be honest, I think it's 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 a matter of of of, of you know sharing views on on where is the industry at, uh, where do we think it will be in a couple of years time, yeah. and you, do you have a business idea that sort of could fit into that context? So I think that is what what uh, what what, what uh, from the business point of view what 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 uh, we managed to have have shared views on, but of course. Again, going back to the click, uh, since we, we, we clicked as, as individuals, that helped as well. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, interesting. So, like, so now you raise investment, obviously, to, uh, to, to Quickspin and, and uh, you, you, you sign off the contracts and uh, you, you start your, your journey here to build this uh, organization. Like, um, how, how was it to adapt to being uh, an entrepreneur all of a sudden and building this organization from scratch and also, you know, working together with Joachim and, and Mats as uh, founders? Uh, you know, it's not easy to uh, to be three founders who uh, at the beginning you, you have the same vision, but as the company start growing, maybe, you know, one vision start going the other way. And like, how was that process in the in the beginning for you guys? Uh, the first, the first couple of days, it felt like it was, uh, you know, what what are we doing here? Are we playing, you know, you, are we playing a house? So we're playing company. We went into the office and like, okay, what's 
what's on the agenda for today. No, I'm, 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 I'm kidding. It, it was, um, in terms of, of co-founding it with Mats and Joachim, I think, you know, for me at least, uh, it felt very comfortable to have two partners. Uh, we were not sort of, we were friends or acquaintances uh, from the business. And Mats and I used to work together at NetEnt as well. So we knew each other maybe slightly right. better than I knew Joachim. But we were not sort of, personal friends, uh, mm. uh, although we have, of course, become friends, uh, close friends. Uh, I think yeah. that was good for us. Uh, and then we did not really have, I mean, we had quite clear areas of responsibility. So there, there wasn't really, really obviously, we have had conflicts and, and arguments throughout the years. But it was quite clear, sort of, at least in the first couple of years, since we were so few people, you know, I'm responsible for that, and Joachim was responsible for that, and Mats was responsible for that. So... We didn't. We, we. I think we try to respect our areas of responsibilities. We would sort of, which did not lead to that much conflict or or, or arguments. That was good. Um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> yeah. No, and then then in general, you know, as you start this organization, uh, like, uh, how was the beginning to kind of adapt uh, yourself as well from just being an employee, where you know you, uh, of course, you know, you, when you when you reach a certain level, it's not about checking in, checking out. You know, you do kind of to some extent carry the ho- work with you home as well. But yeah. I think uh, being an entrepreneur, and especially when you have investors that are, oh my God, you know, you have to like live up to their expectations and. Like, like, um, uh, how did you adjust to just being an entrepreneur all of a sudden? Uh, yeah, good, again, good question. Uh, I think, what well, I think, the, 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 I think the common denominator I have with most other entrepreneurs uh, is that uh, which, which is, I guess, maybe, a, maybe a common denominator in terms of personality as well is that you constantly think about problems or think think about things that can go wrong yeah so <laughs> you recognize that as well <laughs> it's like uh, you, you see problems around every corner or this could go wrong and then yeah. i think maybe that's the downside as well and maybe it's just me i don't know uh, that you you tend not to really appreciate all the time the fact that you do a lot of things successfully you, you tend to focus on yeah. things that can become better because you are so you know, you're, you're so not satisfied with, with where you are and, you know, you want to be a couple of steps further ahead all the time, which I think is is, is, is both good and bad. Um, but thinking back, you know, going, from, you know, showing sort of uh, red numbers to becoming profitable, that that is, of course, the first, I think, driver financially. Um, but then before that, of course, it's a matter of keep setting milestones, keeping milestones, pushing for that. So... Just more, I think, sort of probably work hours wise, I, I probably worked more when I was employed um, or the same level. Mm-hmm. But I think, as you point out, the, 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 the mental aspect of sort of being logged on <laughs> all the time uh, was completely different from running your own company. Whereas, you know, there's no, there are no vacations or there are no sort of breaks in that sense. Uh, you, you know, you need to be aware all the time and, and, and up to date on, on what's going on and what is the next step? Yeah. I guess I guess you are, you're you're uh, you're, you're slightly familiar with that as well. Uh, <laughs> or yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. You know, and, you know something that I uh, am facing as well. I mean, in in a small organization, is that there is, you know, as the MD of, of my little bubble here, it's like there's no one who's ever, who is telling me like if I'm doing good or bad. You know, yeah. uh, and. Um, so it's kind of like you really have to trust your instincts in 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 some sense, you know, and and uh, like you're saying for for good and bad, because uh, when you work in a large organization, you have your manager, you have your performance reviews, you, you work for a larger purpose in this organization, and you, you know you learn from people above you and things like this, which you you know sometimes as an entrepreneur or when you're on the top of an organization, yeah, it, you're missing that a little bit, and that that yeah. can be a bit like playing on your mind sometimes like am i actually doing the right thing here you know yeah that's i guess that's a mental shift that it's 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 if you if you sit on the top it's sometimes you can feel right or wrong maybe a little bit alone to some extent right it's it's ultimately it's up to you to make that decision or do that thing and so on but I, the only advice that i can give i think is to is which i guess to some extent i'm kicking in open doors now but is to surround yourself with with a good team that 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 are, are sort of genuinely honest with you right yeah uh, for us you know 
when we founded Quickspin with Mats and Joachim, obviously we were equal in that sense. So they would they would always give me their honest opinion about what I did wrong or right and so on. Uh, and I think uh, I've I've been you know to some extent fairly successful in, in trying to keep my management team. You know, my COO and my my chief commercial has been with me for many many years now. Uh, so I, I know them. Uh, as well as Martin Joachim, if not even better. Uh, same with our, our, our HR manager. He's been with us for a long time. So we have a, you know, they, they let me know <laughs> if if, uh, <laughs> if if I do something good or bad. And I, I can trust for their honest, honest opinion if, if, I, if I want to, if I want to uh, ask a question. So, um, yeah. yeah, important thing. Important thing if you run a company, I think, to to surround yourself with with good people which i guess is obvious but but uh, yeah. it's worth repeating yeah absolutely and it, and it, and it comes from that not just that it's it's good competent people but to have that backbone in your organization like you mentioned you know your hr person has been with you ceo has been with you for a long time you know so and they end up kind of knowing their organization inside out is like you right so they are the culture bearers in the organization and i think uh, you know that is so incredibly important to to have mm. in your organization because I, I remember we talked about this the other day uh, Daniel you, you know you mentioned that you know your task is not only to uh, you know drive the organization forward and you know take all the decisions like you know you are the source for knowledge for everything but it's also about like empowering your staff so that one day you know you will not be a quick spin anymore for example and then the organization should be able to run still right yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's that is so true. Uh, it, it's it's. Uh, I, I think when we talked about this the other day, I've read I've read one or two management books uh, in my life. Uh, uh, the first one I read when I was at Net is called "Good to Great" by Simon Collins, and I think he talks about or he studied successful, long-lasting companies, uh, and one of the one of the denominators for for. Um, long-lasting success, successful companies is, is that they are not built around an in, a certain individual only it's it's sort of it's sort of leaders that are you know they're visible of course but sort of externally and maybe to some extent internally it's not it's not the only person because what if what if that person leaves at some point in time uh, or decide yeah. to do something something different then then an organization like that is is uh, I think potentially in danger, right? Uh, and you know, credibility is in danger as well, especially if you're a listed company. If you if you built your success story around, you know, what happens when Elon Musk will leave? If he yeah. will leave Tesla, what will happen then to to investor and uh, the organization and so on? So, I think that is. Um, but again, as as with everything, it's it's you need to balance that. Of course, you you um, an organization needs to be led. By by um, uh, not one individual, but by by different individuals, and of of course there needs to be self leadership as well. But I think it's it's um, it's dangerous to be to put yourself on a on a too high of a pedestal, uh, making yeah. all decisions and pointing. You're the only one pointing in one direction. So you need it needs to be shared by different individuals for for the company to be sustainable o- o- over the long run. Yeah, that, that's such an interesting point that you mentioned, you know, Elon Musk and Tesla, for example. And, uh, you know, in Sweden, we have a saying, up som en sol, ner som en pannkaka. Up like the sun and down like a pancake, basically. I don't know how that, well that translated in English. But, it's good, good uh, translation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But uh, essentially what, what you're saying is that, you know, someone like Elon Musk, you know, he'll, he'll see hyper growth in his organization and... and uh, you know, he is famously very, very, very operational into the very, very details of, of uh, how the car is put together and which screws are, are here, which screws are there. And, um, you know, for a person like him, I guess that has enabled the hyper growth of, of Tesla, of course. Uh, you know, now, you know, Tesla is obviously valued at more than all other listed car companies combined yeah so you could say you can so you can make yeah crazy right mm. but so you can make the argument okay he, you know he's leaning that company perfectly but then what you were saying on the other hand he is one individual and if something happens to him and you know there's been times where Elon Musk has not been in the best place uh, you know and he's made mistakes and that has cost uh, the company dearly uh, but if he would go away one day 
I mean, what would happen to the share price? Yeah. And what would happen to the organization, which is now built on having him as the corner store in it? Yeah. And I think you, you probably, yeah, I mean, you think about Apple, for example, with Steve Jobs for many years. He was the only one talking on their sort of keynotes. And I'm not comparing myself with, with Steve Jobs or, or Elon Musk in any uh, single you, way. You don't uh, have to be shy, Daniel. <laughs> the Elon Musk of the gaming industry yeah, is exactly, about to speak. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> now, listen. Uh, no, but seriously, it, it's, it's, I think, but, but I think if, if you think about what he did over the last couple of years before he passed away, was that in, at least externally, uh, and if you read up on him a little bit, I think as well, I mean, he, he gradually handed over the company to not only one, uh, what's, what's the name of his? Um, um, Tim. Yeah, t exactly. Um, but, but not only him, but, but different individuals that are now external also visible to, to both external investors yeah. and customers, but also internally, which, which I think helped help that, that uh, phase out for him as well. But of course, we have very little insights into how Elon Musk's build uh, Tesla, but uh, uh, but that's what I believe in anyway, uh, to, yeah. to not trying to build it around one single individual. I think that can be potentially quite dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. again, quite interesting what you're saying here with, with the kind of paradigm shift of Apple uh, going from being, um, you know, a one man band to a certain extent um, with Steve Jobs to like, just like what you're saying, when you watch an Apple keynote these days, you know, you they are lifting forward many people within the organization. I, I think that's really interesting, actually. Yeah. And it seems to be very purpose, purposeful as well. Yeah. But yeah. then, of course, leaders and leadership are important. And I think uh, Steve yeah. Jobs is, is, is proof of that as well, to some extent. When he came back and Elon Musk, another example, you know, leaders yeah. are important for an organization. Uh, mm. So so just want to point that out as well, that, that, that uh, I don't believe in leaderless uh, organizations no. or, or organizations without leaders. It's, 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 it's important, but as always, balance, I think. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, S Swedish people have this prejudice, uh, I, I guess, from the outside that like uh, uh, we, we like to empower everyone to like an extreme extent for like uh, you gather everyone in a room and OK, what do you think about this? What do you mm. think about that? But I guess there's the balance between that and not being micromanaging and taking every single decision in the organization and somewhere in the in the mix there, there is the key, so to say. Yeah, yeah. In leadership, yeah. I mean, we try to talk about that a lot in, 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 within Quickspin. It's like, make decisions. <laughs> you are competent yeah. people. You're smart people. May, rather make 10 decisions and five of them yeah. are wrong than making no decisions at all. I mean, without mm. decisions, we cannot move forward. So it's so important to, I think, try to repeat that a lot, that make decisions. Mm. You, you know, I'm not the expert within your area of expertise, you are the expert, make the decision. And if it's wrong, we'll, we'll correct it and we'll, we'll do different next time. But try to encourage an organization to make decisions, I think is, is, is uh, super important. But of course, yeah. in order to do that, you need to set direction, context, vision, culture. So um, it's, it's a, a lot of things comes with, with enabling people to make decisions as well. So. Yeah, true. Yeah, th there was someone who said once that uh, not all opinions are equal. And uh, if, if you're in a meeting and you're trying to solve a math problem and there's 15 people in the meeting and Einstein is in the meeting, then they should not be a, yeah, <laughs> they, they, they listen to Einstein. Yeah, they, yeah. Like, it's not a group discussion anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, uh, that's, uh, I, I think I saw that podcast actually. So yeah, uh, right. <laughs> I, I totally agree with that, uh, yeah. that quote. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> Uh, so, so yeah, so um, um, speaking of which, by the way, I, 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 in the middle of here, I wanted to also, before I forget this, actually, uh, Daniel, I wanted to actually uh, uh, give you guys a little thank you here in the middle of the podcast to, to Quickspin, because you were the first partner of Agami Next before oh, really? we launched our product. Yeah, And it's largely thanks to Quickspin, actually, um, that we decided to commit to actually start uh, the product that became uh, Agumen X. And you guys actually took a leap of faith before we had even announced anything to come nice. aboard. Because you believe in it. So I would like to, to thank you guys. But you work in Timmermans, obviously, going on stage in Agumen X 2019. And so, so just, uh, just as a little, uh, oh. give a little homage and thank you to you guys. I, I, uh, wasn't, I wasn't aware, actually, but I think, uh, you know, uh, I said it to you yesterday. I think you've done a, an amazing job coming from nowhere, effectively, to, to become. Uh, 
a very dominant player, I think, in 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 in, in within the the niche that you're in. So yeah, well done, and uh, happy to hear that we were that we <laughs> believed in you guys. But again, I, you know, it comes down to people. I think it was Michael Peterson. I think also. Yep, that's who, right. Who was there? Uh, and we obviously knew you and Martin as well. So it comes yeah. down to people always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thanks for that. I just wanted to mention that here in the in the, in the middle of things too. So I, so I have that mentioned. Um, so so yeah. So I mean, go, going back to uh, to to quick spin and at the beginning here, like, was there ever like a defining moment for you for for quick spin when you know you were kind of finding your way and uh, trying to figure out what games work, what 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 games didn't work? Was there like one game who like predicted you to uh, to new heights, or was there well like one moment that really defined you as an organization? Like now we're a serious player, or was there always like a kind of incremental? Yeah, um, right. Um, I mean, we. I mean, I think we've been fortunate to have a fairly smooth ride uh, in the in, in the past ten years. But I think there are two. There are two key from a business point of view. I think there are two two key events that happened that sort of that that uh, made us to some extent. One was social that we talked about before. That we were fortunate yeah. to to launch social as early as we did. And that sort of generated a lot of revenues for us in, in the early days of Quickspin for the first couple of years, because we struggled quite a lot getting distribution going on, 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 on the gambling side of the business. You know, back then you had a less than a handful of different open platforms, which, which was as the business idea, we, we, we said that we wanted to rely on other parties to integrate and distribute our content. So I made a summary for our board. I think it was two, two and a half, three years later, where we had developed like 15 games of which two or three were were live with the operators. So we had a massive distribution problem. Uh, and then then we said, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to build a platform? Are we going to buy something? Are we going to try and find a partner? So eventually we ended up in 2015. So this was four, four, four and a half years after we, we started. We partnered with Relax for uh, for distribution. So effectively, we made it, we made a deal with them where we we sold their platform under our name and used them as a, a sub supplier, if you if you like, uh, to distribute our content. And then with their you know excellent uh, technology stack and organization, we 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 you know we increased our our distribution massively. All of a sudden, we got all the games that we had on the shelf. We got them distributed, and you know the PNL went through the roof and and. Uh, and uh, the whole business, I think, on the gambling side of the business, transformed when we partnered with them. Um, and now we're, you know, we're live with 130 plus operators, three, four hundred rounds. Um, so that was a sort of a defining moment for the business. Um, mm. And then, of course, you have certain key individuals. I think, as with any company, that you manage to recruit or. or or keep a person within an organization that that made big difference to to certain you know small things that in the end made a big difference. So so uh, you know getting the right people in an organization is not to be underestimated. And that is uh, the other thing I learned from this book I read many many years ago. Is it's, it's not it's not really down to strategy or tactics or or uh, you know getting the right people on the bus is is the yeah. key thing and then you know then you can decide where to go but you need to get the right people on the bus before yeah. you you start executing so and i think that is that is true again for i think for many businesses you need to you need to recruit the right type of people not necessarily competence competence is important if you have einstein on board that's probably a good good person to to keep but right mentality right attitude the right drive um has mm. has made a big difference to to what we've done, and we've done many things right and some things wrong. But we we've been able to compensate for that with having the right type of people that could sort of that that could bridge the gaps between right and wrong decisions. Yeah, yeah, and obviously to get the right people on board, you uh, you know you need to have that uh, that culture that uh, that drives uh, the influx of these uh, uh, highly competent and skilled people, uh, right? So, um, I, I have a question on that note as well. You mentioned, you know, uh, you made some mistakes here and there. Like, well, you know, Quickspin obviously have done super well throughout the, throughout the years. You're one of the major players and and uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, everyone loves to talk talk about what they do well and, and so on and so forth. But I would love to hear, like, if you've ever had like a failure 
in in quick spin uh, that uh, that notoriously that you regret or something like, along those lines. <laughs> oh, <it's>, yeah. <laughs> everything has been perfect. Everything has been perfect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably a lot of mistakes. Uh, you know, it's it's it's. Um, yeah. Whenever someone decides to leave Quickspin, I it, it's it's uh, it's with tears in my eyes. It's it, it's it's like oh. you're losing a baby almost. It's yeah. like although obviously ten years later, and if we're a hundred people now, it it's it's not doesn't feel in the same way as it did in in the early days. Um, yeah, you think, take it personal, right? Like almost, yeah, no, you know, almost like, actually, no. <laughs> almost yeah. actually. Um, <laughs> but of course, people need to to move on and do new of things. Course. And it's it's. I think the average age, I, I I think in Silicon Valley, for if you work at Google or Facebook, I think people work on average like. 12, 13, 14 months, I think, is the average wow. employment uh, period for... <laughs> Jesus for, Christ. It's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> uh, and that makes you think as, think as well about, you know, what, what, you know, employment and how you attract people. You know, what, what is the... What is their why? Why should they come and work for you? You know, it, it's, I think it... it, it uh, if you're into HR, you talk a lot about these gigsters. They come for the gig to learn something and then they move on to the next gig. So oh. I think uh, as an employer, you need to find new gigs. Uh, mm. And of course, a why. why uh, the why for any, anyone working today in this, in this industry and in the tech industry is, is important. Yeah. But going back to the question, I think the one thing I regret was that we, we should have gone for our own distribution and controlling that from from the entire value chain from starting developing the game to distributing it out to the operator we should have done that from day one but we were a bit too cautious uh, we deemed that as high risk going back to the investors and you know the personality traits of us founders we were trying to de-risk as much as we could uh, mm. but if we would have done that uh, 10 years ago we would have been a different type of, of uh, company today. Uh, so, Interesting. so, so, yeah, that is one decision that I that I do regret. Although uh, we've made some good decisions as well, but but uh, business wise, yeah. that that is probably the decision that we we could have done differently in a better way. That's interesting to hear, actually. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that, uh, Daniel. Uh, so, so, so then, obviously, now we go forward, and in in. Um, you know, you, you build quick spin, you establish it, it's, it's successful, and 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 then obviously you you sell to Playtech. Now we are in, I think, 2016, if I'm correct. Something yeah, like that. May yeah. May 2016. So yeah, five five years ago exactly, actually. Maybe even, oh, right. even maybe actually it's the it's the five year anniversary. Anniversary? Yes, oh, uh, wow. around about the 20th, I think it was uh, May. All right, if cool. I remember yeah. Correctly, yeah. So literally five years, more or less, on the day. Uh, you sign a contract with uh, with Playtech. Um, they acquire you uh, as as uh, Quickspin, and this is just something that's very interesting to me and fascinating to be able to hear it from directly from the horse's mouth, so to say. But I am super curious to uh, to understand like how does like a multi multi million euro deal like this happen? Like uh, who contacted who? Like like how were the talks the negotiation like how do they work when it's like that big of a scope like can you talk a little bit like from the beginning how this all happened uh okay um so we had so 2016 but the process i think started probably nearly a year before uh, the the deal went through or at least the the indicative talks amongst the the shareholders and of course, with, with if you have many shareholders, you have different opinions uh, on what you where you want to take the business, uh, uh, what the ambitions are. Um, some people invested from their personal point of view a lot of money and wanted to get the return on their investment. Um, so we we had different opinions, I think, on what we wanted to where we want to take the business, in what way, and uh, some people even wanted to to do something else. So I think in the end, we decided that, okay, at the very least, let's go out and see, you know, in order to fulfill everyone's uh, wishes and, you know, looking at what the majority wanted, we, we said that at least investigate what this could be worth. If there's an interest and what could it be worth and, you know, in, in which context could, could Quickspin exist in the future? Um, so, so at first, I think I, I, I thought... 
thinking very highly of myself that I could run such a process myself uh, together with the founders <laughs> that we could go out and, and present, uh, talk about Quickspin and negotiate the deal. And But in the end, we, we chose an advisor uh, that we had knew, uh, known for quite some time. Um, so yeah, so they helped us to prepare a uh, an investment memorandum um, uh, that went out first as a teaser to, to the industry to, or to... To selected uh, to selected amount of of uh, potential acquirers, um, oh, right. so that was the first step. And then, if if th- they were interested, uh, we moved on to more of a detailed uh, presentation and information deck uh, around uh, where we where we are and what we were planning to do and uh, what was next. Um, and then, all, as with with all processes processes like this, you you start maybe a little bit bigger and then you you narrow it down to to a few selected parties that you that you negotiate with and that you present to and then then uh, uh, then there's uh, hopefully um, or not necessarily but there's uh, in our case it was one 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 uh, one left standing that we felt uh, met the demands that we had uh, both immediately and long term uh, so in the end, the deal went went through on the back of that. Cool, cool. And you know, when, when you sit and negotiate in a room, is it kind of like you know you, you watch the uh, the American TV shows and it's like, no, we want this, uh, <laughs> like, uh, uh, we want more, like uh, like really uh, really aggressive negotiation, or do you feel that the the um, negotiation was more like a like a two way street? You know, we're here to make the best deal possible for both. And that's our intention, and that's what we will try to accomplish here. What, what was, it? like, like on a psychological level? Do you know what I mean? Like, how how did it play out when you actually sit in the room and discuss? Yeah, no. So a couple of aspects to that. I think for myself, I mean, since I'm obviously still here, uh, I were I I I was quite comfortable with with uh, with what I wanted, and I think that was shared with with uh, many other people from our team as well. That. We wanted to continue to operate Quickspin in in, in the form and in, within with the brand and the, the the you know in the way that we did before the acquisition. So we were quite clear on that. And not all uh, parties were would would um, accept that. So they fell off quite early. And I okay. felt that you know if if they could not accept that conceptually, um, I'm fi- we were fine with saying no. So that sort of makes you. Obviously, at least the feeling that you had some bargaining power, mm-hmm. right? I mean, I don't have to yeah. accept this if, if they don't agree to it. And I think so that that made, I think, the whole process quite comfortable for, for us uh, in that we would never, you know, allow ourselves to be absorbed to a, a content unit uh, to a company on the other side of the planet where we had no say whatsoever in what, what the company would do. So... And, and here, 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 I think we're, we're Playtech uh, were, you know, very early on, it was clear that they were, first of all, very used to running processes, acquisition processes. And they, yeah. had, of course, acquired a lot of companies. So they were super professional, I think, in, in, in how they ran the entire process. But they were also quite clear on that, that we're not buying it to change you, uh, you know, continue as, as, as you are. Mm. Uh, that's what we want. And that that made made I think the entire uh, negotiation quite uh, easy. Then of course we also sat around the table. We argued for probably yeah. you know today it was you know tiny t- tiny details that no one can't even remember or care about anymore. But uh, but yeah. uh, it was all in all it was uh, not that of a much of a dramatic <laughs> negotiation. Uh, I have to say. Um, uh, interesting to know because I think it's one of those uh, things you know. Uh, Hard to hard to grasp how for, for for someone who obviously hasn't been in these situations, but I'm I'm just very interested in negotiation in general. You know, negotiations are part of our lives. We negotiate every day for things. You know, but uh, this would be obviously the ultimate like high stakes negotiation where like you you know in your case you know you have leverage, so you know you have options, so therefore you don't have to kind of like. 
sacrifice an arm and a leg to make a, a deal, and that changes the dynamics for Playtech because they know that yeah. that you have other options, so they need to make sure that you know they fulfill your wishes and so on. Yeah, I, I like the psychology in the uh, uh, in the things. So. No, no I, I I think you're absolutely right. It's 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 a matter of of having your uh, having leverage, uh, whether it's sort of perceived leverage or if, uh, whether it's actual mm. leverage. I don't, I'm not sure, but in our case. We had both interest from from several different parties. We had different type of options on the table. We were not forced yeah. to 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 sell the company, uh, and we so so it felt like we had we had all the outs um, yeah. that we wanted to. But but if, if I'm gonna sort of pass on any 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 advice, I think one using an advisor do that that's a good thing if yeah. you're looking to sell uh, and run it as a structured process i think that was that was good Th then you have it's like selling your your at least how it works in, in in sweden if you sell your house or your apartment you know some people try to sell it under on the market but if you go out on a and you know on sunday at one o'clock i'm going to show my apartment or my house people can come and have a look and then then i think that that uh, if you're looking to get you know, clarity in your options, that is what you should do. But of yeah. course, every situation is different, right? So so for us, that was the best. Yeah, exactly. And people are different uh, in general. There, there's, um, there's a really interesting book that I can't remember the name of, but the author is um, Chris Voss. Um, so Chris Voss with a V. Uh, and I really, if anyone listening to this is uh, interested in negotiation and negotiation tactics, that is the, you know, master class of... Uh, of, 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 of books to, to learn about them. Chris Voss, he is a former hostage negotiator for FBI. Mm -hmm. so he was the person on the phone who is like uh, trying to get the, uh, the kidnapper to release the hostages, basically. So super educated. And then he turned you know, to the business side after that to then uh, teach uh, businesses how to, uh, how, how to negotiate in a professional manner. You know? yeah. uh, and you would think when you when you're like, listen to someone like that that he would just be like you know how do you negotiate to just get everything you know in the negotiation but what he teaches is no it's not about that it's it, it's about making the other party comfortable and making them trusting you and then you make a deal that is good for both of you yeah so that it doesn't fall through yeah, yeah. i completely agree it's a matter of getting sort of again connection understand getting the other person to understand your viewpoint getting uh, you know trying to it sounds like such a cliche but i think if you can if you can get the other person to understand that this is a win-win for both yeah it sounds very obvious right but if you do that then then you have all the chance in the world to 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 make a deal disregarding what what it is that, that you are negotiating um if you wanted to be successful long term uh, yeah. so so not at least in my years within business that's that's uh, always been my approach uh, trying to to um, find a balance for both parties uh, it, it worked yeah. well so far probably lost a few on uh, as a result of that but I think long term um, it's also a matter of what you can stand for right as well as, as, a, as, a, as an individual um, knowing that you can exactly. whatever you say you can stand for um, yeah, exactly. And because on the other end of the spectrum, you have like Donald Trump's The Art of the Deal, you know, which is uh, there it is all about like the ruthlessness in, in making a deal where you are the winner and there's like one winner, one loser, and you always want to be the winner, oh. you know, uh, this uh, kind of thing. But, you know, you might end up kind of like winning a couple of negotiations like that and you might end up uh, losing far more, you know. Uh, and I think that is the beauty of kind of uh, finding a negotiation tactic where you realize that like our ambition here is not only to get to what we uh, everything that we can it's also to maximize the chances of this deal actually happening yeah and then but, you have to concede some things as well no i agree but of course it depends on if you negotiate with donald trump and he, uh, that <laughs> that counter person has got that that type of attitude obviously you need to bring out your a different type yeah. of negotiation tactics tactics but then you're True. at least you're aware of what you what you want to achieve and why but then yeah. then um, maybe it's a bit of a swedish thing i'm not sure or if it's a northern maybe. european thing i don't know but 
At least yeah, that's true. that's uh, how we do things uh, up here, or at least yeah, how yeah, I, exactly. I try to do things. Yeah, exactly. We are we are problem solvers, or if you <laughs> or if you say uh, you're scared of conflict, it could be either. Or, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's a fine line. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, Dalia, this is super interesting to 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 hear this as well. And I mean, um, you, you, now obviously you uh, you you are owned by uh, like by Playtech, and uh, like how has that changed the dynamics for like you as the CEO not being the owner anymore? And, um, and and the organization itself. Like, was there a challenge to work under these new premises? Um, well, first of all, I think when it, I mean, it, it, I think it's inevitable. Not maybe not inevitable, but I think immediately when you do the like that, it changes the dynamics a little bit for the organization. And for us, we had we had we'd been running for five years. We had the typical sort of startup mentality uh, although we were at that point i can't even remember we if we were 40 people back then or 50 i, I don't remember but um so it, it's like a you enter a new phase almost as a company uh, when something like that happens so i think that that uh, and talking about the why before that, that we talked about with with for yourself yeah. maybe and for 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 the employees it's it, i think what we had to do back then and and still we, we work on uh, and you, you need to continuously work on that is to try and redefine what is the purpose here why am I here and what is the purpose of right. this organization? And it's a completely different thing. If you're five people, you're going to take over the world and you're a startup, yeah. we do everything together and so on. And all of a sudden you're a hundred people. Yeah. So, so that has been, that's been a change, not necessarily, well, partially because of change of ownership, of course, but just as an organization grows bigger, uh, trying to redefine your, your, uh, or reposition yourself from a startup to a, a, a contender, uh, trying to with an ambition to do something um so so yeah that's been a been a change uh, for myself personally it was it was uh, not necessarily about the money trying to sell although i, I was a shareholder before um it was you know we started quick spin with the ambition to try and build something that is truly amazing and something that would sort of surpass myself and and uh, you know it sounds so cliche like but it's you know trying to build a legacy that would you know last when i leave and when other people leave you know mm. i want quickspin to exist forever as a brand yeah, that's my of sort of vision and i want us to be you know synonym with if, if you're going to start a casino today unless you have quickspin content or quickspin products you cannot succeed that is sort of the the mental right. uh, the mental vision that we have that you know we want to be synonym with success um, yeah. And we are not there yet. We're on our way, but we're not there yet. And, and uh, yeah. until we are uh, crossing the finish line, I will will probably still be around, disregarding of of an um, an employee or a or a shareholder. So that that's yeah. that is what keeps me going. And I'd like to think that that is also what keeps uh, my colleagues going. That um, you know we 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 have an aim. We're going to work towards that. Um, yeah. So that's that's our why. I yeah. think. That's such a cool uh, uh, vision. I, I love that. Uh, that the, the vision is basically for Quickfin to be so strong and so important as a supplier that as an operator, you just have to work with you guys. Uh, otherwise, you can't be successful. I, I love that. I think that's a great vision for, uh, for a game supplier. <laughs> uh, so it, just to, to, uh, to kind of start rounding things off uh, today, Daniel, um, uh, a little bit. It's been fantastic talking to you, by the way. It's, 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 I, I knew this was going to be fantastic. I mean, we spoke about it yesterday. I knew it was going to be great. Uh, uh, good chat, I think. It's, it's, yeah, uh, I forgot about the fact that we're, we're being filmed and recorded here. Dude, we've been <laughs> going at this for one hour, 20 minutes oh, so far. Shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. <it's>, uh, <laughs> time just disappears. Yeah. Uh, but... Um, you know, I, I'd really, I'd be, I'm curious to know as well, Daniel. You know, you, you build Quickspin, and this has been your world for the last ten years. You know, but is there is there anyone like uh, any other organization that you really look up to in the gaming industry? Uh, oh, there, yeah, there are many in different aspects, but I think um, it's it's hard. Uh, listen, I think it's it's hard. Also, you know, knowing what I knew about evolution back in 20, 2007. Yeah seeing where they are today it's hard not to be you know every quarter to to not be impressed by that organization um a fantastic uh, company uh, so yeah. 
so yeah so evolution is my is my answer um on what they've done and you know from from where they came with the vision and you know with how, how they have executed on that absolutely brilliant yeah yeah, yeah no, I know. I I can see why. I mean, it's it's just continuous exponential growth for years and years and years. Yeah, uh, kudos to evolution, of course. You know, um, and and uh, as a final question for you today, uh, Daniel, what, what about yourself now? Like, what what's you share the vision for the future? Of course, uh, that uh, you want to build towards uh, being in that kind of dominant uh, position yourself. Like, but uh, where where do you see uh, you, uh, yourself and Quickspin in, let's say, a couple of years' time? Uh, you know, we, we, we shall not rest until we've uh, sort of reached our vision. No, I think, you know, with this, uh, I started talking about sort of, um, we talked about failures before with, with controlling distribution. And now, mm. actually, in this quarter, 10 years later, we will be in complete control ourselves <laughs> without any third party involved of our entire distribution chain. And I've been waiting for this day for many, many years. Uh, so finally, we are we are independent, uh, executing our business strategy, um, controlling all aspects of the business. So now we're going to take the next step. We're going to build the Quickspin 3.0. We're going to scale up in terms of amount of games, more markets. We have a couple of exciting things in the pipeline around sort of entertainment and gamification. Um, and go into, you know, so far we've only basically been present in Europe. So we're going to try and spread our, our name, our games, our product into new markets. And we will try our best to to make this industry better in a sense of, you know, uh, I know Todd talked about, I think it was Martin at Evolution talked about copying. We're going to try to level up yeah. this industry and try to come up and invent new things. Because I think ultimately that is truly the only thing that you can do to level up an organization, at least in the way that I see it. So we will try our best to invent new things that pushes boundaries and brings more entertainment to, to the players. Uh, what that is exactly, I don't know. But that's, that's the ambition and that is the aim. And I think that is what hopefully will make us synonym with the success. Yeah, absolutely. And a, and a good, good point uh, as well, Daniel. You mentioned there's, uh, there's been a lot of copying in the in the industry from other game suppliers, and that's obviously something that is ho like holding the industry back, you know, rather than focusing on innovation, which is, uh, at the end of the day, the long-term strategy uh, here. So I'm happy to hear that you're on that uh, side of the fence, so to say. Uh, Brilliant, uh, uh, Daniel. Like I said, it's, uh, it's been fantastic uh, t talking to you in general and, and getting to know you better. We, we talked about this uh, uh, the other day as well, but we, we've been kind of uh, uh, around each other and we, we met uh, briefly before, but uh, it's been a, a pleasure to, to get to know you now during this process uh, as well. And I, I really hope that uh, we, we can do this again. And um, uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, pandemic permitting we'll see you at uh, i give next in october as well i hope that i look um, forward to for for i um, can't wait to travel again uh. <laughs> yeah <laughs> same, same here same here but uh, uh, until then like i i wish you all the best daniel and, and thank you for for coming on today is there any last uh, word from you as well uh, it was a lot of fun actually uh, yeah. good, good chat <laughs> we should do this more often <laughs> absolutely man absolutely all right so th thank you so much daniel and thanks everyone for listening in as well i hope uh, people have still left uh, here uh, you know one and a half hour later but uh, it's been great uh, learning experience for me and i hope uh, everyone else has learned something as well so all the best to you daniel and all the best to everyone who's listening in thank you <laughs>